Hi, I'm Jack. Hi, I'm Rob. Hi, I'm Tim, and welcome to the podcast Crohn's and Ulcerative Colitis, How to Spell Them and Other Problems. Jack, are you doing the professional introduction? Because you like saying the name of stuff over and over again. Oh no, I will do that separately. Just, I think I was gonna, get, I was gonna suggest you just ask Mike to introduce himself to, to crack it off, yeah. and then, and then yeah. go from there. If you just do a clap, then it's a good, good start. Okie doke. So oh, that didn't, know? that didn't work. You did not. <laughs> <laughs> it, got it got filtered. It got filtered. <laughs> it got filtered. <laughs> That's the funniest thing I've seen in ages. <laughs> Bang. <laughs> Shall I go clap? Just just say the word clap. Just go clap. Yeah, I was gonna say just... <laughs> do clap, just go clap. Clap. Um so hello. Um thanks for joining us, Mike. Um would you be able to give us just a very quick introduction into who you are. Yeah, so I'm uh, Dr. Mike McFarlane. So I'm a consultant gastroenterologist and I work at University Hospitals in Coventry. I've been a consultant for a couple of years now and I look after people with IBD. Fantastic, uh, including myself in there. Um, for, I think for from my perspective it'd be interesting to to sort of know just sort of briefly how you how you sort of decided to specialize in into that area it's a question i've never actually asked you so it's quite so when i was at med school i always thought i was going to want to do uh, pediatrics so i thought i'd want to look after kids and then i think my second or third year at med school i had a placement at the gastro department at coventry with um we run the old consultants who's retired now, a lady called Jane Eden, who you might have uh, come across once or twice. Yeah. And um, yeah, I absolutely loved it. So I, um, when we were kind of finishing med school, I got um, my foundation one year, first year after qualifying, I got a job in peds and a job in gastro. I thought I'll see which one looks better. And uh, I was working for uh, for Prof Nicolo, who, uh, who I know you know yeah. very well. And yeah. Um, yeah, I loved it. And then he, um, I asked him, I started to ask him a few things about what I'd need to do to get into gastro. And then he, um, he told me I was doing gastro and um, he kept giving me things to do. And I'm not, I, I didn't have any free will, really. It was, uh, <laughs> he decided he wanted me to do gastro. So I did it. So, but no, it's great. I love it. I, I made the right choice. I couldn't have, I couldn't have done, I couldn't have done pediatrics. <laughs> no. Excellent. Um, and I think with the with with the expertise that you've got, I think sort of we'll, we'll start with a really really um, important question, um, and and one that I know that a lot of people will be desperate to to know the answer to. But how do you actually spell Crohn's? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is there, um, is, there, is there a U in there? Is there an H? Is the no U, where's the H? Nobody knows. Nobody, Nobody knows. knows. Absolutely. There no, is no, silent P, we, silent P, P as well. I think. Yeah, yeah, silent P in there. But um, no, I, th I think I think a good starting point would be: um, it, would would you be able to sort of give us a sort of a brief overview into you know difference between uh, Crohn's ulcerative colitis? us and if if at all there, there is a classic sort of um diagnostic journey yeah so um i think i mean they're both types crohn's and ulcerative colitis are both types of inflammatory bowel disease so it's inflammation that affects the gut effectively um two main types crohn's disease ulcerative colitis crohn's disease is inflammation that can affect anywhere from your mouth to your bum um Ulcerative colitis is usually just the well, it is just the large intestine, um, so the colon, which is where the colitis comes from. Um, in terms of a typical kind of diagnostic 
journey, if you like, when someone gets diagnosed ulcerative colitis because it's affecting the colon, they tend to get a lot more symptoms to do with their bowels. So you tend to get a lot of bloody diarrhea usually. Starts off a bit more insidiously. You start to find yourself going two, three, four times a day. Start to get a bit of blood, a bit of mucus. Sometimes can start going to the toilet overnight, things like that. And then depending on how long they're willing to accept it, people eventually trot along to their GP. GP might do something. GP might sort of uh, might not do something. Um, and then they'll get referred into hospital. We'll do a few more tests, including a colonoscopy usually. So stick a camera up the tail end and we'll find some inflammation. And then we start them on treatment. So how long that takes usually depends on how long it takes the person to go to their doctor in the first place. Crohn's, because it can affect the small intestine rather than the large intestine, the main features people tend to get with that are pain. Um, you can sometimes get a bit of bloody diarrhea as well, um, but that would only be more of a feature if the inflammation was affecting the large intestine as well. So people with Crohn's disease often take a bit longer to diagnose because it can be a bit more non-specific, a bit of belly aches. Someone might think they've got a bit of IBS or they've had something funny, so they don't go and see their doctor for a while. And then there's that inherent delay and then they might get a little bit better, so they think nothing of it. And then six months later, they get the same again. And it just takes that little bit longer to kind of uh, to get them into the system, if you like, and to do the test that we need to do to diagnose it. Good. Um, Rob, would it, I mean, from, from your perspective, was would, how, how were you diagnosed? I don't think I've actually asked you actually this question ever. Yeah, pretty much exactly as Mike described, you know, almost to the letter, you know, I, when did it start? I remember feeling a bit ill after I graduated and I moved house. And during that house move, um, we did five or six different trips to up and down the M5, up and down the M25, sorry. And there was McDonald's. I remember stopping at McDonald's every time we did like these three trips. And I was like, oh God, I don't think it's these three rounds of McDonald's has agreed with me very much. And I thought, <laughs> oh, that's probably a, a, this probably a, and that's basically how it started. And, uh, and then I think, GP kind of around November time and then I think I was finally diagnosed in the February after they told me I had a bacterial infection to start with um, and gave me rounds for antibiotics for a couple of months and then that that obviously didn't touch it it's got worse and I was just yeah exactly as Mike described kind of lethargy fatigue tiredness urgency frequency the kind of classic symptoms but I had no pain so I was still working still doing all of that it was just I couldn't really leave the house early morning that's when I struggled and that was pretty much the plan really and then I was over in Essex at the time, saw the the gastro over there, gave me high dose steroids, and you know overnight, oh, I feel better. Forty milligrams of prednisolone does does wonders, really, <laughs> and, uh, and and yeah, it does you feel amazing. And that was pretty much the journey, really. That was pretty much the cycle of of the the initial diagnosis with a, a couple of camera tests and stuff like that as well. Interestingly, uh, I had my first camera test. They diagnosed me with with colitis, and then when I went, I moved uh, moved locations saw another consultant and he said, oh, we, we don't actually have a diagnosis for you. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, yeah, you had a camera test, but they actually didn't do any biopsies. So we can't actually confirm what you have. And I was like, oh, is that, is that strange? He said, I've never had anyone not have this before when we're suspecting IBD. So I was in a bit of a weird, weird, um, weird bubble really. But yeah, so it took me actually about 12 months before I got an official on paper diagnosis rather than just suspected. Mm. So McDonald's gave you colitis, is that what you're I think that's the only, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, other fast food is is also available. <laughs> yes, yeah. Who is Somewhere there's a lawsuit right? alarm going off in McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, what's the, um, what's, what, um, I, my specialty is rheumatology, which is how I've sort of wangled my way onto this because I know a little bit about inflammation. But I was, I was just wondering about how, you said about how long people take to get go to their GP and stuff is it do people deteriorate quite quickly with these conditions or is it something you, you know I'm thinking like if someone's frequency went to twice a day from once a day that's probably not enough to send them to their GP but are they going to have that for an extended period of time or it's really variable so you get some people that are quite slow burners and that they'll take months to go kind of two three four times then they start to get blood um and they that tends to be where the delay is with them. But then equally, you get some people who absolutely crash land on us going literally within the space of overnight or even a week, like 20 times a day plus blood, mucus, going overnight and everything. So they're 
kind of what we end up calling acute severe colitis is. And you can get that happen when you've already had colitis for a while, but it's usually the, the people who have never had it before who just get this really acute, severe type of colitis who end up needing to come into hospital. And those guys, their disease is so aggressive that uh, a good proportion of them, maybe even a third or a half, end up. We can't save them with uh, even with high dose steroid and with tablets and medications, IV medications, anything like that. And they end up needing an operation before their bowel falls apart on them. Is that so the, uh, the, 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 the toxic mega colon? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's uh, th- those guys are very sick. So we kind of we go through the um, so when you guys take your prednisolone, you take 40 milligrams when you come into hospital and you get IV steroids, you get the equivalent of 100 milligrams of pred for three days. And that's your kind of window to get better in terms of your bleeding and diarrhea. If it gets better, then we put you down to the tablet steroids of 40. Um, If it doesn't get better, then we give you, if we can, this drug um, infliximab, really heavy duty anti-inflammatory drug. It's a biologic. And you then have 48 hours to respond to that. And if you respond after 48 hours, great. We kind of get you home on the steroids and further infliximab doses. But if you don't, then often people have to uh, have to meet a surgeon. Mm. Can I Which, ask a question on that, Mike? Uh, yeah, sorry, go on. I was going to say that's really interesting. It's when I've had numerous hospital stays before I ended up having surgery. No one ever explained that to me. No one ever kind of explained that we're going to try this for three days and then do this if we if we're looking for this response or not response. I mean, I did two weeks in hospital once on on IV steroids with and yeah. without having surgery, and it was no one ever said this is what we're looking for or we're going to roll out this new drug. It was just kind of a watch and wait really it's really variable how good i mean you guys will probably know better than me because you'll have seen more doctors i've only sort of seen myself and the people but you know what i mean with how clear we are and explain things because we're so used to knowing what we do and so used to doing what we do that we sometimes forget that Mm -hmm. people don't know what we know particularly the patients who are on the receiving end of it so we always at commentary we always try to really kind of be clear about from your point of view, look, this is what you're facing in the next couple of days. This is what we're looking mm. for in terms of improvement. This is what we're worried about in terms of deterioration. So that you've got that kind of roadmap in your mind of what the next few days have got for you. Because otherwise, like you say, historically, we did have people on IV steroids for days and days and sometimes even weeks. And if you're not getting better with it, within kind of three days of IV steroids, we now know that realistically, you're not going to get better on just the steroids. And we have to do we have to throw the kitchen sink at you really with the infliximab and if that works great but if it doesn't we need an exit strategy before you get more and more poorly yeah have you got any idea on sort of percentages mike about you know if you, you've got your you, you said about the severe and acute and then yeah. the slow burns and then i'm assuming there's a gray area sort of in the middle have you yeah. got any sort of idea you know the first thing people are going to be worried about is they're in the severe acute one um yeah. how many of each I mean, the acute severe colitis is there. I haven't got a number off the top of my head, but they're on the rarer end of the spectrum. They do happen. And obviously, in some ways, it's more traumatic for them because they're well one week and then two or three weeks later, they suddenly don't have a colon anymore and they have a bag. And every from their point of view, everything's just kind of fallen apart pretty much. So it must be absolutely horrible for, for those guys. But in terms of actual breakdown, in terms of numbers, the vast majority of people have a relatively slow burn type thing and then it's like a cut one of those normal sort of bell-shaped distribution things mm-hmm. you get you get some people that are sort of at the slowest of slow burn that they never actually realize they've got colitis they just go their whole life undiagnosed they think they've got a bit of ibs or something vast majority of people are kind of this slow kind of over a course of a few weeks or months gradually worsening symptoms and then at the other end the rare ones you've got the the absolute crash landers and and in terms of the, you know, you've mentioned a few different medications in, in there. And um, is there, from a patient perspective or sort of, you know, as as sort of hosts on here, we're sort of, gen, apart from Jack, who's obviously very specialised, but uh, we're generally considered generalists, right? So is, yeah. is there any sort of indication of um, certain medications and severity of you know for, for us to sort of look at and go actually 
if they're on X, then it's more likely to be milder or, or, or not really. It's a case of what works for patients, works for patients. It's not a correlation necessarily. A little bit of both, to be honest. I mean, if you're talking about colitis, then a relatively milder form of it, because what I always say to people, we've got like a treatment ladder. Um, and the lowest rung of the treatment ladder is absolutely nothing. You manage to just get by without it. That's relatively rare in the grand scheme of things. The next rung up for colitis is if you're on um, any kind of type of mesalazine. So that's things like Octase, uh, Acecol, Pentase, things like that. That's kind of like aspirin for the gut. That's a relatively mild anti-inflammatory that just settles your symptoms down. If that holds you, then that's great. You don't need anything stronger than that. Rung of the treatment ladder above that is um, what we call immunosuppressant medication. So this is things like azathioprine, 6 mecaptopurin That's tablets that you take to suppress your immune system to control the inflammation. The rung of the ladder above that is all the biologic medicine that we have. Things like infliximab, adalimumab, um, And then we've got newer ones coming out that we generally call them biologics, but technically they're these things called small molecules. Um, just because they're a lot smaller than the biologic ones. And that's things that are coming on the market now. There's something called filgotinib and lots of other ones that are all kind of coming out. They're the stronger drugs. That's for kind of colitis. With Crohn's, because it's more aggressive, it's very, well, we don't suggest that people with Crohn's take the mesalazine, like the lowest rung of the ladder anymore, because we just don't think it's strong enough. Very rare. You have some people taking azathioprine, that's kind of the rung above that with Crohn's, but the vast majority of people with Crohn's will be on a biologic drug or something of that nature. Mm. Um, sometimes you can have a biologic in combination with things like the azathioprine or mecaptopurin. Um, but in general, Crohn's is the more aggressive of the two, so it need, and it's the harder to control, so it needs the stronger, the stronger drugs. I mean, it definitely that mm. sort of definitely hits with sort of my history of you know, initially I was on mesalazine in in many different forms yeah um, with GPS changing things from prof and prof writing angry angry letters back saying that you won't be changing it and then I've also <laughs> had um <laughs> azathioprine and then as you know now I'm on um, adalimumab which um, judging from talking to lots of people with Crohn's they seem to that seems to be would it be fair to say that's the the gold standard now was starting in, in some somewhere around that type of yeah performance? something around that it's quite the reason we go for adalimumab a lot of the time is because obviously you can inject yourself at home so for young people with lives with jobs and things like that it gives you that flex, flexibility um if we give infliximab which is a very which is the same type of drug as um adalimumab but it's um it's one you have to have into the vein so you have to come into hospital to do it every two months and that means missing a morning of work or something like that. So, you know, what I mean, for young people that are working, it's it's not the best. We, te we tend I always give people a choice and say, look, we've got this or got this because, I mean, unofficially, the, it, the cost doesn't come into it to me. It's monopoly money. It's not my money. It doesn't matter. So, it, um, you know, what I mean, you give people the choice and then they'll choose to either come in and have the injection or to, um, or to do the injection themselves at home. The only time I don't offer a choice is when I'm worried that the person won't take the injection themselves at home. And then we get them booked in for the injection into the vein because that way you mm. know they are having the drug. Interesting. Mm. I'm telling you, yeah. Now, yeah. I won't be doing that, should I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Mike, I, was, I went to, and I'll, I'll get Tim and Rob's um, idea on this. Just coming back to the journey, you said right at the beginning about someone goes to their GP and the GP might do something, might not. And I just want to flesh that out a little bit as to what's the general experience of people because increased frequency of bowel movements, not an uncommon symptom for tons of stuff. And if you watch TV, you know, especially, I don't know why around Christmas time, but you tend to get, you know, it's about yeah, you might yeah. get bowel cancer, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and that, that's obviously increased frequency and, and, and blood and stuff. So what what's the, sort of the general experience of people's initial interactions with healthcare, do you think, with these symptoms? So it's um, it's interesting because it all depends on how worried the person is. If, 
you know, I mean, if they've had any bad experiences in the past in terms of their family and also on the GP as well, um, because GPs have to know a little about a hell of a lot, whereas I have to know a lot about this relatively narrow field of of things. So the thing with colitis and Crohn's is it usually affects younger people. So they'll go to see their doctor and usually the first thing they they say is, I've got I'm bleeding and I'm going to the toilet a lot. Mm -hmm. Have I got cancer? So because they're obviously worried about that. And then the um, it usually in terms of what the GP does, it will usually come down to the kind of the story that goes with the symptoms. So if you've talking, if someone goes in and says, oh, "I had a curry on Saturday night, and then on Sunday I'm going twenty, I was fine on Saturday, had my curry, and then on Sunday I'm going twenty times a day with blood, my belly's absolute agony, I feel terrible." That is far more likely to be an infection. You know what I mean? They, the meat wasn't quite cooked or something like that. They picked up a vi- they've got a virus or something like that that's given them gastroenteritis or an upset tummy. Um, and in that situation, the GP might do some blood tests. They might get them to do a poo test to look for infection. Or they might not. It very depends on how worried the GP is, how much the GP knows about it, to be honest. Because like I say, they have to know a lot about they have to know a broad spectrum relatively narrow so if you get someone that isn't that familiar with gastro stuff they might do from my point of view what would be tests that aren't very helpful um whereas vice versa if you were to come and see me about some of the stuff that you go and see your gp about like if you had a problem in your throat or something like that i just look at you like you had two heads if you know what i mean it's all about who you see so it's it's very in terms of what the gp will do at the door if if for example you had someone that would say for the last two months i've been going increasingly frequently to the toilet for a poo with blood with mucus i'm going a couple of times overnight what i would want to know is what their blood tests are so you do a blood test and the other thing is a poo test and the reason for the poo test is to look for inflammation in the bowel now the poo test is it's called a fecal cow protector now it's it's actually at its most useful when it's negative because if it's negative and normal, you can say with kind of 99% certainty that the person doesn't have a type of IBD. So they probably don't have colitis. They probably don't have Crohn's. If it's raised, then the amount it's raised kind of gives you an idea of how much inflammation is going on in there. So the GP will get the result back. And again, it depends what they're used to. So, you, for example, a normal fecal cow protecting result is according to the lab less than 50 but we know from when we do the cameras that if the value is less than 250 we're probably not going to see that much in terms of inflammation when we put the camera in so if you get a reading that comes back at like 100 you'll be like oh that's only slightly raised it's in a kind of gray area whereas if you get a reading that's one and a half thousand and you're like yeah there's inflammation going on in there we need to do something about this Mm. The funny thing is with the poo test, again, it depends on the context. So the first example I gave where the person's had a dodgy curry and it's given them uh, and it's given them an infection, a gastroenteritis. If you do the, the cow protecting test on them, it will come back positive because the inflammation causes kind of leaking of blood from the gut. And it's a protein that's in the blood cells that the poo test detects. So, again, it's all about the kind of context that you uh, you do the test in. And we get, I see a lot of people in clinic who the GP will have referred in with a really high fig cow protecting. And then you talk to them six weeks later and they say, oh, no, my symptoms have all gone and I'm back to normal now. And you're like, great, because that means you, without any treatment, that means you've just had an infection. We'll check the poo test again just to make sure it's gone back to normal. But feel free to go away and carry on living your life. Just maybe go to a different uh, curry house or something. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's all about that. There are some tests that you would want them doing, like a blood test or a poo test and things like that. And then really beyond that, it's it's kind of you're into the more advanced tests like your your colonoscopies, your MRI scans and things like that to try and work out whether it's colitis, ulcerative colitis, or Crohn's. What happened to yeah, you, Tim? Interesting. What happened to you, Tim, when you do a new exercise? So I've got a very atypical, I'm pretty certain Mike probably wouldn't even know this bit, but um, so I was initially diagnosed by pure fluke at 16, uh, 16, 17, where I had an allergic reaction to diclofenic. Um, 
No, I didn't and, know that. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. So basically, they did then uh, did uh, camera down, camera up to check um, that there was no significant damage done, and then just went, "Oh, by the way, you've got Crohn's." And I was like, "All oh, right, okay. What do you know? What does that mean?" Uh, nothing. We'll we'll just keep keep an eye on you. Long story short, fast forward um, five six years, I was a more stereotypical um sort of presentation is in terms of what mike spoke about at the start where things were just getting worse more around pain particularly i was getting left-sided hip pain as well uh joint pain fatigue all that sort of stuff and went for a second opinion under um broth um and and was sent for a battery of what i thought was routine tests um including an mri where they found um, a big, huge um, psoas abscess, which um, explains my my unresolving left hip pain, um, <laughs> which I was trying to tr- treat with um, sort of self glides, uh, side glides, and hip flexor loading, and <laughs> all that sort of stuff. Um, sometimes it is actually the hip flexor. I think that's yeah. always See, sometimes, sometimes it very is, rarely yeah. it is actually the hip flexor. Yeah, yeah. It might be an abscess, and, but it's and, still the hip flexor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sometimes, um, and then at that sort of in in that sort of window, I started to get the classic signs of sepsis, um, and yeah, I just got admitted for emergency stuff, and then. That was essentially my my welcome to Crohn's um, to to the point now where all I have to do is mention that I think my Crohn's is playing up to the GP and they will arrange everything very, very quickly. Or conversely, I call um, the team that Mike works with and they'll either answer it for me or um, speak to Mike directly um mm. so yeah I don't, I'm very atypical in my presentation but um in terms of the journey that I went through um but yeah my my big thing which I know Mike knows that I talked to him about is like I'm a sucker for not paying attention to my change in my bowel habits and my bowel motions and I'll, I'll just quite happily go from two to three three to four five to six so you know slow burning so like I now almost obsess about um how often i i, I keep a little record because i'm 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 bad for for thresholds mm. of that but yeah that that's my journey jack to be fair very atypical very, Hubert. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, i'd like uh, uh, michael will be able to answer this because you you'll see more people but like most of us don't pay attention to that particularly unless it goes catastrophically wrong right so like yeah. Without being overly crass, I've been twice today, which is a little bit unusual for me. I normally go once, but like, I haven't. But other than Tim just mentioning it now, like I've not really thought about it. Do you know what I mean? Is that yeah. sort of normal? No, it is. And often we'll say to people, "Have you noticed any blood or slime in it?" And they look at you kind of like, "But why would I look?" <laughs> yeah, just like some people do. <laughs> <You're> just... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I yeah. always think it's one of these things that until something changes, you either don't notice it or you mm. don't look. So if you suddenly notice you're going three, four, five times a day, you might have a little or your wife and you notice a bit of blood, you're suddenly going to have your head down the toilet bowl going, What is going on here? Whereas otherwise, yeah. like you say, I mean, without being crass, I mean I tend to be a bit more frequent, shall we say? I tend to go about three or four times a day mostly because I like to go a couple of times at work because it's nice to know you're being paid to poo at work. But um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's, uh, Next it's... time he's over running for your appointment, Tim, then you know exactly, exactly what you Exactly, yeah. I'd be like, I know <laughs> I'm self-employed, so that's, yeah. that doesn't work. Yeah, me too. I have, to, I have to hold it to once, otherwise I'm losing money. Mm. <laughs> no, I, I think that's it. That's, I think, and I don't know whether you'd be the same, Rob, um, but it is something that I am, I wouldn't say that I'm obsessed with, but I'm very aware of, like like Mike says, that, that I, I would be very aware of how often I'm going and I would look at, like particularly when I, I thought that I was in flair, be looking at the, you know, the state of the, the toilet paper. Mm. Yeah, I was 100%. And I... I was very good at ignoring it, very similar to you. Like there are occasions when, like my wife and my mother had to take me to my appointments because they knew that I would mm. sit down and go, 
you know, I, I, my gastro is brilliant. There's a guy, a chap called Dr. Makins down in Cheltenham. And uh, I'd sit down with, and he'd say, how's you going? Oh, how's it going? And I'd be like, yeah, doing all right. My wife would be, or my mum would be like, he's not. <laughs> like, he's, <laughs> he's really not. And they're, they're like, how's the medication? I'm like, yeah, I think it's working. Do you, know, do you want to come change, you know, reduce dose or come down? Yeah, I think so. And they're like, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Let's get back to the drawing board here. I think we need to revisit this. So I didn't know what that was. I don't know where that came from. But it, maybe it was just like, I liked my gastro. And we just had a bit of a chat about it. And I was like, chatting about other stuff. <laughs> but it was... Maybe, I don't know. I'm not really sure what that was, but it was definitely good. And obviously now I don't pay attention to that at all. I don't need to because I haven't sat in the toilet in 12 months. So that's a uh, that's a bit of a win. I think I've, I think we calculated at one point how many lifetimes I'd spent on the toilet and it was like five times worth or something like that, you know, if not more, you know, in, in yeah. 10 years, give or take. You know, if you're thinking I was, yeah. you know, two, three, four hours a day sometimes, when you look back at yeah. that, you're like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's madness, quite a lot. isn't it? It's madness what you, yeah. you kind of uh, feel that you should put up with. But I, I I've reflected on it since I've had um, the stoma put in. And I think because I've had two, obviously the one that was reversed, subconsciously I saw it as accepting that I'd sort of failed, if that makes sense. So I'd just go, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm not going more to the toilet. It's it's just that I've eaten something. Mm. Whereas it had been going on for, for months, if not years, of worsening. So I think, yeah. you know, there, there was that... Um, bury the head in the, in the sand and hoping because I didn't mm. want to go back. I just remember subconsciously like that flare yeah. that I had when I was 22 yeah. f- from my perspective. I, yeah. I really remember my first consultant, uh, not the one that saw me for nine years, but one that saw for the first year and going to consultant. And I was on, as Mike said, they put me on high-dose steroids. They put me on a, a sulfazalazine 5-ASA type thing, the granule one, I remember. And they, they put me on that. I remember him saying, you know, how have you been? And for some reason, whatever the conversation was, I came out and he'd taken me off the steroids and reduced my dose, dose of sulfazalazine. I remember sat in there thinking, is, is that what I wanted from this? Like, I think I'm still quite poorly, but I couldn't really explain that to him <laughs> so much. So to the point where he actually reduced my medication because we came to the conclusion that I was doing better than I was uh, when I first started. So I'm not quite sure what that was, but it didn't. didn't you, do sometimes, you do sometimes see that. And I think it's interesting because I think part of it is you get so used to your symptoms, you guys, that mm. you then normalize it and you're just kind of like well i'm going four times a day so but i'm feeling better because i'm not going eight times a day anymore and you forget that actually two is kind of your normal you just Mm, you feel better than you did when you're at your worst but you can't remember what normal is you just feel a bit better so therefore you normalize it and also there's that thing of we're sometimes bad for leading you to that point because we want you to be better so that you're might fell over (laughs) <laughs> oh dear <laughs> but, uh... oh there he is oh, there, <laughs> there we go i'm back there we He's go back. um but yeah there's that element of you want to be better but also you want to tell us you're better so that mm. we feel happier that you're better and we want you to be better so we're kind of we we all want everything to be better so we kind of managed to manufacture that betterness sometimes when what is the actual objective objective yeah. thing about what's yeah. going on? I mean, I, I think you're probably right. Like the first 18 months or so after so sort of 2010 and 11, after I'd had my ileostomy reversed, that would be the only time in my living memory I fell under normal where I'd be going once or twice a day. And it was so bizarre that I was going once or twice a day with no urgency, no this, no that, no the other, mm. that I almost felt felt odd with that. And then even yeah. to the point, and I don't know whether you, whether you sort of have this, Rob, like when I feel gen- generally unwell and I don't know what to do about generally feeling unwell it might just be a cold or something like that i often would go and just sit on the toilet because i knew that was safe that i was was just like when i'm unwell i go and sit on the toilet um it was ever so bizarre that this relationship that i had sort of had with the top with with the toilet right Mm -hmm. because i've just become so used to yeah you know safe space yeah yeah 
and, and I don't, the toilet I radar. Ever, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I ever ever did that to a degree, but I, I, I again for for ten years I'd never kind of hit remission, whatever that means in terms of whether that was you know on camera testing or I mean I had a period I started I uh, went through all of the the maps as as you listed Mike and I I went to tofacitinib one of the small molecule ones um later i think that's been moved to something different now but yeah i did that and i had about i don't know eight nine months where i was pretty stable and i was also it was a very chilled out time i was like getting up at five and meditating and eating like a really really good diet and all of that together i think made a difference then had a kid and then it like that was like four years ago and it kind of it's like you've been drop kicked in the face and that you know all of that yeah. kind of changed um but uh, yeah you know uh, children change things generally don't they but um yeah that was the only <laughs> one that really worked for me and I, a, a window but i remember it feeling really quite weird for me i graded how well i was by how soon or how early i could leave the house in the day because my symptoms were always worse in the morning <laughs> or overnight so if i you know if i was getting up at night waking up at night i knew i'd probably pretty close to being hospitalized if i was yeah but it would be kind of can i leave the house before 9 10 11 12 1 can i not leave the house at all and that's kind of how i graded it and there obviously be a bit of variance there but you know very rarely would i have to, if i was ringing up saying i can't go into work or i was having to move patients because i wasn't going to make it then that was a challenge you know but for for eight nine years i didn't see patients before 12 o'clock in the morning so you know, i didn't book anyone so my day started at 12 o'clock pretty much and that was for everything so that goes for flights trains holidays everything i would never have booked an early morning flight i'd never have booked to be anywhere we went everywhere the night before because generally evenings were good uh you know so that was all a, a bit of a change recently so that's how i graded how well or how bad i was so that's the biggest change for me post-surgery it's been like oh i can leave the house at six o'clock in the morning yeah, like, this yeah. is quite nice <laughs> this is and so now i love being love it and i've always been a morning person so that always i dealt a bit of a bad hand there but now i'm back to the other way Makes me think Rob, about, um, and again, there's probably for you to jump in on, Mike, is like how much, because these are long-term diseases, right? So that how, but how much are people relieved that you give them that kind of diagnosis and this plan of, oh, well, we're, this is the, how, the course of what we're going to do to try and make you feel better? So it's really variable. You get some people that are relieved to know that there's there's a reason for why their bowels are doing what they're doing then you get the flip side which is where there are people that are kind of they don't want that to be the reason because the thing i always am i'm always very not quick but i make sure i tell people about it when i'm explaining to them is if we tell you you've got crohn's or ulcerative colitis it it's not something we can cure it's something we aim for control on and that control is so that you can live as normal a life as you can but I always say it's the when we get people feeling well, that's good. But it's also when you worry a little bit, because the longer someone's well, the more likely they are to think, oh, I can just manage without my my tablets today and yeah. tomorrow. And then you start to get that slippage. And the thing is, with Me. the inflammation from Crohn's <laughs> and, and colitis is once you lose control of that inflammation, it can be hard to get it back. It's a bit like a runaway train that you've got to then stop again. And in some cases, you've worked so hard and the patients work so hard to get the control of the inflammation that you just don't want to don't want to lose it. It's like if, if Tim tells me he's going to start his stop his medication, then I'm never going to speak to him again. Or he can, <laughs> or he can find a different gastro <laughs> consultant. Is, 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 you know is, is, is that why Prof retired? Because I stopped his <laughs> medication so. and, he, and, he, and he saw, he got fed up with me just flaring again. He was just like, I've had enough of this. But that is that is very, that is definitely me to a T. Like I, I was really well controlled. And I remember having the conversation with Prof saying, I think it's time I came off the medication. And him going, no, I don't think so. And I went, I think <laughs> it is. And he went, no, I don't think so. And I was just basically back and forth for about 10 minutes. And I, I, I hand on heart admit that I wasn't the most compliant, but it was well controlled. And then I felt like me stopping it gave me some sort of control almost. But a pseudo control where I'm just like, it didn't really, because it was just the beginning of the end, the beginning of the next player, if you like. Mm. And I think that would be the, like if, if anybody's out there listening and thinking, Oh, I think I should come off. 
please don't. Like, please stay on your medications because... I second that. I, I second that. <laughs> yeah, I've, I, you know, I've done it twice where I think that I know better and uh, and, and I really don't. And, and, like, I've ended up with, you know... Rounds of surgery, which you know we'll talk about in uh, on a on a different e- episode. But like, yeah, Mike's sort of hit the nail on the head for it, and that's just me from a personal experience. Like, but it felt like I should come off, even and though that, I was being. But told. that's the thing, isn't it? It's that it's that taking back control. Not to sound like a, a Brexit person, Jesus Christ, I can't believe. Can't believe <laughs> unbelievable yes. um but you know what i mean it's that it's that wanting yeah. some element of control because for years you've had no control over when you go to yes. the toilet over being able to leave the house before 12 in the morning it's wanting that bit of control back mm. and it's and it's completely understandable but what i always say to people is you know what i mean let us because if you've got someone well for a couple of years we, i always say there you're not on these medicines for life you're on mm. them for the foreseeable future and there is always a chance if you get someone in what we call deep remission, which is where your bloods are fine, your symptoms are fine, your poo tests are fine. We do a camera test or an MRI and we can't find any active inflammation in there. And the thing we're all going for at the moment is what we call deep remission, which is where if you take a biopsy from a bit that you know is inflamed previously and you don't see any inflammation that time at the biopsy, that's mm. what we call deep remission. So if you've had someone in deep remission for a while, then you think, oh, maybe we can get them off this. And yet you maybe have this kind of mutual experiment where you say, we'll just hold your drugs for a few months, see how we go. If you're well, we'll keep holding them. If you're not and things are slipping, we start them again. But you, Mm. because obviously, like I say, it comes down to quality of life. And if you can get someone in deep remission off their drugs and well, then that's a win. The vast Mm. majority of people, we aren't able to do that with, but we do get a few that we can. So you always kind of hold that hope that, and every patient holds that hope that they'll be the one that can get by without the drugs. But yeah. it's kind of, it's mm. it's cherry picking when you try the experiment rather than... That's really interesting. Yeah. So my mum falls into a similar category. My mum's someone with Crohn's and she she has, has flare-ups that last a year, you know, year and a half, maybe two years, and they very bad flare-ups. You know, she'll be hospitalised, high-dose steroids, all that stuff. Then she'll have five, ten years with zero symptoms, zero medication, and then it'll mm. flare up again. And she has that, and she would never say she would never say she doesn't have Crohn's or is in remission. She just says, "Yeah, I've got it. It's just calm at the moment." Is the way that she kind of puts it. Um, yeah. And she just kind of waits for it to flare up. And I think she's had, you know, when she was first diagnosed, was very ill for many years, and then it, over the kind of, you know, now she's sixty or so. It's kind of it has changed in that in how it flares up. You know, for a month, two months, three months, six months, and then goes away for a few years. It's a different presentation. It's really common when you get that, particularly with um, with Crohn's, but also with colitis as well. Is we know that obviously vast majority of people who get it get it when they're young in their twenties and thirties. Um, but if you have colitis for kind of or Crohn's for kind of twenty thirty years, it starts to just kind of fizzle out, and it's almost like it's run out of fuel almost, and it doesn't quite flare perhaps as badly as it had done in the past, and the flares become a bit more infrequent, mm. and then they you start to kind of gradually wean off the medications and then you end up end up kind of 60s or 70s maybe off everything with just a bit of a a scarred bowel and a bit of um it doesn't quite do perhaps what it once did because it's uh it's so worn out by everything it's been through over the years but there we do use the phrase kind of burnt out colitis burnt out Crohn's for people who it just it fizzles out and we don't know why it fizzles out Someone cleverer than me will work it out at some point. I'm sure. But... <laughs> yeah, there's 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 two things I'd I'd like to just quickly pick up on is is the the bit where uh, sort of the family link, if there is any. Firstly, where Rob sort of mentions, you know, his his mom has Crohn's and he obviously has ulcerative colitis, and then also had. sort of then Lee had had very good. <laughs> Uh, good, good <laughs> nuance there. Um, I was going to say the, the one out. definite way we have of curing colitis, I should say. We always say we can't cure IBD. There is a way of curing colitis. It's just whether or not people want to yes. take it or they. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, and, and then just moving on into sort of the quality lo- uh, quality of life, really. But yeah, uh, the, the first part. Yeah, it's just is there any sort of um, 
sort of family genetic link uh, that you're there's, aware of Mike? there's a little bit so like ivd we always say it's multifactorial which is basically doctor speak for we don't really know what causes it there's a little bit of <laughs> genetics there's a little bit of environment possibly a little bit of a uh, an infection or something that triggers the the kind of the inflammation cascade but in terms of like running in families the kind of the the numbers we quote are if you've got colitis then there's a five percent chance that a first degree relative will have it if you've got crohn's there's an eight percent chance that a first degree relative will have it so you're talking about kind of one in 20 one in 10 kind of thing um so obviously crohn's is slightly higher so there's that slight maybe slightly more to do with genetics in there but to put that in context the risk in the kind of the prevalence in the population of crohn's and colitis is one percent so I always think it depends if you're a betting man or not, because one an increase from one to five percent is either four percent, which sounds like nothing, or it's five fold increase, which sounds terrible. So it's whether or not you're a, you're a gambling man as to how how kind of bad that risk is. But there is there is some there is evidence that it does cluster a little bit more in families, um, but it's not a definite kind of your mum has it or your dad has it so you will get it and your kids will have it as well yeah understood and then uh, i think the one of the reasons that sort of rob and i and uh, jack sort of were talking around these things is you know you go into these um you know support forums and things like that and you know we're all guilty of it i suppose is is you go for support when you're at that that worst time really and and sort of you you mentioned there like, you know, being on medication and all these sorts of things improves quality of life it doesn't take away the fact that you you have the disease or in rob's case he, he went to very extreme cases of, of, of getting rid of his uh ulcerative colitis but um like obviously rob and i can sort of share our, our aspects of it but like from from your uh patient caseload like can people live, you know, good, varied quality of life? Because obviously in, in forums, you often see the worst. And, and, and that's, you know, what we wanted to do is kind of get a balanced balanced idea of, you know, living with IBD. So I think, yeah, quality of life is something really interesting. And it's something that's kind of there's this move towards asking more about it in clinic. You know what I mean? We're doctors. We like symptoms we like to ask you about how often you're pooing if there's blood in it you know all the gross questions we're perhaps less good at asking people how they're doing you know what i mean how how are you feeling about things at the moment how's work how's your family how are your kids do you want to have kids are you worried about having kids because you're worried you're going to give them colitis things like that are you trying for kids but you can't get you can't kind of you if particularly if you're a lady like are you trying for kids do you want mm. to have kids? Can you not get pregnant because your Crohn's or your colitis is, is hard to control? Because we know that the the hardest thing with, with pregnancy and IBD is actually getting pregnant because uncontrolled IBD just suppresses your fertility. Um, some of the medications we give out can affect your fertility as well. It's less used now, but things like sulfsalazine that you mentioned, Rob. Sulfsalazine completely tanks your sperm count. So you had sort of men who couldn't can conceive with their partner because they're on sulfsalazine um some of the drugs we say not to not to get pregnant on because there's risks to the baby um and things like that so it's it's really interesting that as and in my in my mind it's because for years for for kind of crohn's and colitis all we really had was steroids and now as we've got kind of more more drugs to throw around if you like and you'd like to think we're getting better at controlling things that we have perhaps that more time and more awareness to ask about the other things that that matter perhaps more to people than their bowels you know what i mean we i know we've talked to him about work you know what i mean can you actually go to work and rob you're saying about not being able to see patients for 12 o'clock you know what i mean that's that's a shit situation for you, isn't it? Because you're a morning person as well. I'm a morning person. If I was forced to not be able to do what I want to do in the morning mm. because I was having to live on the toilet, it would be absolutely miserable. Um, 
so I think there is this kind of push now and there's a lot of work being done around kind of questionnaires for people and like scoring systems because again we are we are doctors we're slightly binary people we like numbers so we like to be able to say oh your quality of life score last time was eight this time you're a 10 so look you are doing a little bit better even though you perhaps can't see the wood for the trees because obviously you guys with with IBD you live it every day so there is sometimes mm. that and that normalization of symptoms so that six months ago you were only going three times now you're going five times you've normalized that because it's such a slow mm. change whereas we see you every six months and go well you're going more often than you were now and now you're saying you're scoring six on this whereas before you were scoring eight what's happening yeah. are you okay mm. kind of thing so how quickly it gets integrated into things is it will vary on different places it will vary on different doctors but we are kind of we're trying to be better people i guess and actually remember there's a a person on the end of the bow that we're treating i think yeah i, th I think sort of in terms of the you know the quality of life that i know rob sort of as or things that rob's managed to achieve and, and things like that because when you you dive into these support forums it's 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 obviously very negative narrative a lot of the time but i think rob correct me if i'm wrong and anybody else that you you know who got has got ibd because I, I know other people in my life but they've gone they've been able to live pretty fulfilled lives I, you know the or is, there's the potential don't get me wrong there's episodes where life is pretty pretty bad but you know they've they've been able to go and live a pretty decent life would you would you agree with that rob and mike 100 oh, i mean i think that the the way to think of it is not you know the, it's the cards that you doubt you know uh, are are shitty cards in, in one way but it's then how you react <laughs> to it that's the most important thing so you can be dealt a shitty card but you know, and you've got two options you can sit and complain about it we can kind of get on and that's not just ibd that goes for every medical condition you know i through the, mm. the podcast i run we have a facebook group for like back pain and sciatica and it's exactly the same exactly the same type of forum now, unfortunately forums and things will be biased towards people who do want to sit and discuss their symptoms on the internet and discuss how you know they were dealt such a bad hand and yada 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 and it, obviously people who are you know running around mountains probably won't sit and complain on on the internet so there will be an inherent bias there but Definitely. i think lots of people have dealt lots of lots of crappy hands and it's it's how you react to it that's that's more important rather than the hand you're actually dealt i guess yeah i think that's yeah i think that's true for that i'd agree with that whilst it's horrendous at the time and there's times uh, you know i don't know whether mike remembers this but the, there was a point around this time last year mike where um I was rather very low and I wasn't particularly happy yeah. during my recent flare. Um, I remember. What a difference. Yeah, what a difference. Like, um, I think I remember saying to, to to one of the staff members, like when they came over and said, um, is there anything I can do before I go off shift? Saying, oh, you could take me to Ward 13 if you could. Meaning like, you know, I'm happy. I've, I've, like, I've carped. I'm happy to like give up, like. It was that painful, but what a difference, you know, a, a year makes, you know, I've um, gone back to work full time in, in, uh, in healthcare, got a new job coming up in January, all these sorts of things. But in that moment, you know, it's awful. And, and I think that's, that's one thing that I think like, like Rob says, you need to acknowledge, but like through the support and, and, and what have you that you get these days, it's, you know, you can't come through it like my blood work i think from march i think has been quote normal i don't know from what i've been told i don't know but like yeah I've, it's yeah this time last year was a, a completely different different kettle mm. of fish so um i think for those who who might be listening it's it's yeah it can be pretty dark but people can get through it like rob what did you do iron man something stupid wasn't it like I, I did you had to stop. What I'm disappointed is he had to stop. Like you didn't, know, you didn't finish, did you? That's it's just I so disappointing. Too. No, so so post post operation for my ileostomy, my a mate came to me when I was in hospital and said, uh, "I found this really cool race. Do you want to do it?" And I was like, "What is it?" And he's like, "It's a 50 mile run in the Arctic Circle." And I was like, "When?" And he was like, "June." And this is end of October. And I'm like, "Hmm." 
okay. And I, maybe it was just the tramadol that I was being IV'd in. I was going to say, you were hopped minutes. up on something. That sounds <laughs> like a terrible idea. And, uh, and, uh, and it, so I was like, cool, I've got Absolutely. seven months to train for a 50-mile race after, after a, you know, <laughs> end, end, end ileostomy. And, and I went, yeah, cool. And I, mem- I remember him saying to the nurse, oh, um, can you make sure Rob does his two laps of the war today because he needs to start his training, whatever it was. And that was it, you know, holding a catheter in one hand and, uh, you know, one of the <laughs> IB, I, I drip things in the other hand and yeah that was it so we went to the 50 mile race and i i managed when i only actually did 43 miles we got cut off because bad weather and after running for 14 hours in one degree weather in the arctic circle it was rather cold but i did another one about a month later and i did a 44 mile one and actually did finish that one so oh, well it was pretty it was uh yeah. it was good yeah but no so it was, it was a silly challenge but good fun there weren't i couldn't find anyone with stomas running ultra marathons it turns out there are actually quite a few but on Google search, there are not many. So trying to do what I could to raise some awareness for it. That's very good. Yeah. Um, to pick up on your I, point, Tim, um, yeah. about what you were feeling last year, and I remember you ringing me about it, but we see that reflected in other um, illnesses and diseases, like the ones that I work with. Some of the types of arthritis, for example, depression is as high as like 40% people have with, mm. with those kind of long-term illnesses. Um, and you obviously pe- people's mental health peaks and troughs as a natural cause, but you add in that kind of longevity of symptoms as well and impact on your life. Like Mike was saying, you, it's not surprising that people feel no, feel pretty yeah. awful. No, and and and, and, and agree. Like uh, I was talking to a colleague at work who's got um, a chronic condition, and we were t- having exactly the same topic. She she deals with. Um, chronic pain spinal um sort of pathways and, and she was saying exactly the same like there's there's no wonder that you feel particularly low at those th- these sorts of moments and it if anything it's it's arguably natural natural and understandable that you are feeling because it's a lot to deal with a lot to deal with um i think um what one sort of final question for from sort of myself really um for for sort of jack and mike is i'm sort of conscious of some of the audience that sort of would potentially listening to this in terms of msk clinicians and and generalists like myself from a professional perspective um what sort of potential uh, comorbidities and 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 sort of potential um, clinic um, symptoms that run alongside um, and questioning might you sort of look into for you know for for people with um, you know IBD question rheumatology type questioning um, you know the, I'm just thinking of somebody that I've had this week with unexplained back pain as an example Jack who who, who we were talking through. Um, just before we jumped on this call, like what sort of broad broad brush advice would you give to patients and generalists with 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 these sorts of symptoms? Uh, yeah, symptoms really. So I mean, I think the main, I think the main symptoms we kind of they call them extra intestinal manifestations. So it's basically when you've got your colitis, we know that the inflammation in your body can then trigger inflammation in other places a bit like kind of lighting the match. Um, so the things where we always ask about when we first see someone are um, sore red eyes, um, pains in your joints. Now, the pains in your joints can be, there's different patterns of it. You can get mostly the large joints affected, it's like your shoulders, elbows, hips, knees, bottom of your back. Or you can get people that get the small joints of their hands and feet affected. Or you can get people that kind of, it's a bit of both. Um, and again, they tend to notice their symptoms worse when their bowels are misbehaving, when the uh, when their IBD is active. So, or it can sometimes be like the herald of a flare coming. So they'll say, "Oh, my hands are starting to hurt. My my hips hurting. I know I'm going to get a flare in the next week or two. Um, you, the other thing we sometimes ask about is funny rashes and um, on the skin and things like that. Funny little red bumps, particularly on the shins and things like that. But I think the the symptom that bothers people the most is certainly the aches and pains they get from their joints. 
and where it can sometimes be quite tricky to work out. And that's when we get you guys as physios involved or the rheumatologists involved is when um, is when you're not quite sure, particularly as people kind of head into uh, their sort of late 30s and 40s and you start to get the aches and pains of, uh, of wear and tear. Um, is whether or not the the pains and aches they're getting are because of arthritis related to the IBD or if it's just that they're starting to get a dodgy hip or something like that. And it can sometimes be very tricky to to unpick, which is why it's always useful to have a, a friendly rheumatologist to uh, to send people to when you've got a when you've got one you're not quite sure about. I think Tim and Rob have both rung me about those sorts of things <laughs> i think um it's funny isn't it like because like i i'm on the opposite i see the opposite end so i have the patients with the back pains and the tendon problems who then bowel yeah. habits change and it's like what's the chicken which is the egg yeah and you ask ask a gastro and it's all from the gut and then you ask the rheumatologist it's all from the from the joints and i think from my point of view it's like um i i teach with a with a colleague uh occasionally and he um he says, once you've got a diagnosis, it's not a shield against getting other stuff. Hmm. So you can, like you said, you can get other types of arthritis. You can you can still get joint injuries and you can still get those kind of problems. But also it's about not assuming you've got a, just a dodgy hip or hmm. oh, I lifted that thing in my back because, because it is all so linked and it is all so complex. Um, and, and like you said, Mike, we don't, we don't, re you boil it down. We don't really know what's going on. Like we can make some pretty good, <laughs> we can make some pretty good guesses, but it's, it's the onion analogy, isn't it? You peel back one layer of the onion. I, I know what's going on. Second layer, I'm starting to struggle. Third layer, I've got no, you know, get and talk to me about biochemistry and I've got no idea. <laughs> and so it's like, and I remember Tim rang me. I think it was probably about his back. Uh, aid yeah. and I two years ago I don't remember it might even have been during it was, the pandemic it, was it during the pandemic it was and it, it was, was it was the start of this flare Jack yeah so it would be about eighteen months ago and you and and like it's it, and it's the poo thing again it's like he's going oh my back's just been aching a bit and I'm like well, was it worse is it worse in the morning and he's like oh maybe and I'm like does it feel stiff and he's like yes it feels stiff and I'm like and then he, Tim's going oh i've got inflammation in my spine haven't i and i'm like yes <laughs> and it's <laughs> sometimes it's it's about you know you don't it's like we were talking about with the forums and stuff you don't want to cue in too much to everything mm. that's going on like if you're hyper aware of every time you go to the toilet that's not helpful but equally you've got to be aware of what's going on um and it's it, it's a difficult balance to strike i think no it is and you get a lot of people that have um particularly when people get into their 40s, 50s and 60s and they start to get other things going wrong. And then they'll just be like, oh, I've just had ache in my belly for a while. It's just my Crohn's. It's just my Crohn's. It's just it's just this. And it, you, you worry from kind of the doctor point of view because you don't want to miss something. But equally, you don't want to you don't want to put someone through loads of potentially unnecessary tests every time they get a new ache or pain that might just be a bit of wear and tear it might actually be their Crohn's it might be they had something dodgy it might be there's something else going on in there and it so it can be quite tricky sometimes to particularly when people are of a slightly nervous disposition and they they feel they need a test every time they get something happening yeah. you don't want to make them not addicted to the test but you know what I mean you don't want them to then need that level of reassurance every time they feel a bit of a an ache in their belly or an ache in the joint or something like that and it's a very hard balance to strike and it mm. i think it's different for each patient and it's also different for each doctor because each each gastro consultant you see or rheumatologist you see will have and indeed any doctor really we all will have a different level of kind of risk averseness if you see when you get some people that are yeah. very risk averse that will want to do a test all the time and then you get some people that are a bit perhaps more not blase but a bit more comfortable with saying no i'm happy that that isn't this and we don't need to do a test for that and it's a very personal thing that level of risk that you are willing to accept for yourself but also for the patient as well because ultimately it's 
it's not a risk that it, it's a risk that we're sometimes making on behalf of someone else which can be very yeah very tricky yeah and i think that's particularly if you've got an established diagnosis something that i, I do with yourself mike and, and the wider team uh, I, I now have learned because i'm if anything the opposite end of the spectrum of i won't bother you at all i ask for a uh, and this is just how I've I've learned to phrase it is is you know what's the threshold for me bothering you, yeah, um, and and just sort of asking it that way. No, and that's good because again, everyone's everyone's different, aren't they? You get some people that will ask that will kind of never bother us and then appear in an absolute heap, like you. Mm. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and then you get some people that will. That will worry that will worry about it every time they they fart or something, and you know what I mean. That's yes. quite a flippant way to put it, but there is, again, it's the the extremes of the the spectrum you deal with, and it's very, it can be very tricky to, it can be as tricky to reassure the the worried people as it can be to drag the the blasé people kicking and screaming to the hospital <laughs> to have the uh, the treatment they need, Mister College. <laughs> yes, I know. Awful, awful. <laughs> no, no. It's a good place to end a bit of Tim bashing, I think. <laughs> yes, I think so. I think so. Yeah, yeah. That's very good. good place to end. But no, yeah, no, that's awesome. That's been yeah, really thanks. interesting. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mike. That was fascinating. That's okay. That's happy I could talk to you all day about it, actually. Yeah, it's really <laughs> interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or all night, as it is. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. thanks guys it's been a, been a pleasure yeah yeah absolutely brilliant